Hola, ¿cómo estás? Espero que estés súper bien. This is Tamara Marie, host of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Now, before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity that you're definitely going to want to take advantage of, especially if your goal is to become fluent in Spanish. For a limited time only, my team is opening the doors to listeners of the podcast to take advantage of a free language coaching session. Now, in this session, it's not just we're teaching you about verbs or grammar, but we're really going to do a deep dive into what are your goals for learning Spanish, assess where you are on your journey to fluency at the moment, and help you map out a 90-day plan for how you can get to fluency. So we are going to help you take your Spanish to the next level, whether you're afraid of speaking Spanish or you just get a little bit nervous when you're talking to native speakers, or maybe you've got some of the basics down, but you really know that you struggle with getting your Spanish to flow and your listening skills aren't up to par. Whatever it is, even if it is a specific grammar issue, we will help you map out how to tackle that. And normally these sessions do cost, so we are offering a few slots for free. There are limited spaces available and they'll only be open up through the end of the month. So make sure you sign up. Go to SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach. That's SpanishConSalsa.com slash coach to book your free language coaching session where we will help you map out a 90-day plan to get to Spanish fluency. Okay, let's get started with the episode. Bienvenidos! Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Mari. Hola, queridos oyentes. Bienvenidos al episodio 125. Welcome to episode 125 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. In this episode, I am super excited to bring to you my conversation with Alex Morel and Desiree Godsell. Alex and Desiree are professional dancers who specialize in Latin style dancing. They bring their passion and energy for dance to their teaching and their performances. And if you haven't seen them perform before, you are in for a treat. Make sure you go to our show notes page at learnspanishconsalsa.com slash 125. Um, you'll see links to some of their performances. Um, they're just a phenomenal uh, couple to watch. They have undoubtedly become the leading couple representing bachata clásica, which is also known as traditional or Dominican style bachata, which I always think is funny because bachata comes from the Dominican Republic. So calling it Dominican style uh, bachata is a little redundant, but there is more than one style or flavor to how not only bachata music is performed, but also how it is danced. So to make the distinction, sometimes you'll hear classic or traditional or Dominican style bachata, which really means it's more authentic to the bachata that originally came from the island versus the more modern forms that we may hear today. But that's a whole other story. Um, Apart from coaching and training dancers and dance instructors across the globe, Alex and Desiree are also part of the official judging panel at some of the world's most prestigious dance championships. In our conversation, we talk all about how they got started dancing, what brought them together as dance partners and ultimately led them to form a dance company, and how they've managed to keep up their energy and motivation for spreading their passion for dance throughout the pandemic and beyond. In particular, we talk about their Dance for a Cause initiative, which I have to admit, I signed up for, but I completely punked out and didn't make it through the entire choreography, but it was so much fun, nevertheless, just to start dancing again. And of course, it was for a good cause. Now, this episode is in English and Spanish. And if you want to join our community of podcast supporters, go to LearnSpanishConSalsa.com slash support, and you'll be able to access the transcript and translation for this episode and all episodes of the podcast. And this is a great way to test out your listening comprehension skills, especially for all of our interviews that are in Spanish or both English and Spanish, we can hear people speaking Spanish in a conversation. So if you'd like to get access to the show transcripts, discounts on private lessons, and priority for your show topic requests, 
sign up at learnspanishconsalsa.com slash support. Now, make sure you stick around until the end of this episode to find out how you can get a special discount if you want to learn how to dance from Alex and Desiree. Hola, bienvenidos. Welcome to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast, Alex and Desiree. Hola. Hola. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to join us on the show. And I do have to say, you guys are some of my favorite dancers to watch. I love sort of your energy, the way you work together. So I'm excited to get to talk to you about uh, a little bit more about what you do uh, as dancers and then how you sort of got started with Alex and Desiree. So I want to start with you, Desiree. Um, just tell us a little bit about you for our audience that may not know you guys yet, although I can't imagine, but <laughs> just tell us a little bit about you, where you're from and uh, what you do. Yes. Hello, everybody. Hola, como están? Um, I am Desiree Godsell. I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. I'm not Dominican. <laughs> uh, Contrary to popular of, belief, right? <laughs> yes, that is like the first and only thing that everybody always wants to know. It's like a, you know, anyway, but I am of the world. I did my, recently I did my ancestry and it looks like I'm 2% of everything. So I might be the thing that makes up the Dominican. But anyway, I uh, grew up in Houston, Texas. I've been dancing all my life. You know, my mom put me a dance at a young age, went to a middle school, high school, college for dance. I have a BFA in dance education. And I am, I moved to New York after to start dancing. And actually before, when I was in Houston, my mom kind of introduced me to more like partner dances to like cumbia and merengue. And, uh, you know, I continued to do those when I moved to Philly. And then when I went to move to New York, I really like did a deep dive into the, the scene. And um, I didn't realize that I could dance professionally as a Latin dancer. So then I was like, oh wow, this is crazy. And then I started doing that. And I was also on tour with this uh, singing recording artist, Santi Gold. And I toured with her for like 10 years. So in between touring with her, I'd come back and then do some Latin gigs and Alex needed a substitute for his dance company um, with Caribbean Soul, the, the bachata company. And so I was like, yeah, I'll be the substitute, be the alternate. And then um, his partners never came back. So then there went that. <laughs> then I just kind of stayed and uh, then later on joined the, the salsa division of uh, Caribbean Soul. And then we've been dancing together since, like, as a partnership since 2015, right, Alex? 17? 15? Yes, 2015. It's always blurred. Uh, <laughs> we're just building our age. <laughs> uh-huh. And um, I have a son who's two. He's amazing, an amazing husband. And, and, yeah, that's a little bit about me. So you've been dancing your whole life. You like been doing this professionally, which I know is hard for a lot of people to do because a lot of people like to dance, right? But then being able to make a career out of it is like a whole nother level. So I uh, will talk a little bit about that as we go on. It's a whole different situation. Yeah. Entonces, Alex, eh, bienvenido al podcast. Y cuéntanos un poquito de ti, de dónde eres y cómo empezaste a bailar. Saludo a todos, soy Alex Morel, originalmente nacido en República Dominicana, en Santo Domingo, y criado en, en New Jersey. Y bueno, la historia mía es parecida a muchos inmigrantes que vienen de República Dominicana. Mis padres son de comienzos humildes y entonces vinieron a los Estados Unidos para, para tener una mejor vida para, para mí, para mis seis hermanos. Y yo siempre... Me crié escuchando la música, salsa, merengue, bachata. A mi papá le encantaba el merengue típico, que es eh, de casualidad mi, mi música favorita de bailar, el merengue típico. Entonces, eh, escuchando la música me, me ayudó a apreciar la cultura, a, a apreciar la música y también observar el baile. No puedo decir que desde un comienzo me, me encantaba bailar, pero sí me escuchaba, sí me gustaba diferentes tipos de música, el R&B, el hip hop, el reggae. He criado en Patterson, New Jersey, 
y bueno, eh, conocí una sobrina mía que llegó de, los, de República Dominicana cuando tenía como 12 o 13 años y a ella le encantaba bailar. Y ahí cuando habían reuniones familiares, nosotros siempre nos juntábamos, mi, mi sobrina me jalaba a bailar, mira, así se baila el merengue, mira, estos son los pasitos de bachata, eh, la salsa se baila así. Y entonces ahí coincidimos, hicimos como una pequeña pa pareja, como quien dice, en, la fiesta, en las fiestas familiares siempre eran nosotros dos bailando la noche entera. Luego cuando entré a la, a la universidad, mientras más me conecté más con los latinos, especialmente los dominicanos, eh, me conecté más a mi cultura, a mis raíces y luego ahí comencé a, a salir a diferentes discotecas. Me encantaba la música más y más, no podía estudiar sin escuchar merengue, bachata, salsa y lo mío era la salsa. Cuando comencé me acuerdo yendo a, la, a las discotecas y mirando los tremendos bailadores de bachata en la discoteca, tirando sus pasitos, eh, dando figuras de, de, de salsa y me encantó y me quedé con los ojos abiertos y dije un día me gustaría bailar así. En ese entonces pensé que solamente se podía como que uno nac nacía con eso de, de, de baile. No sabía que yo podía bailar así también. Hasta que un día una amiga mía me, me presentó una pareja de baile que trabaja en la empresa de ella y me dijo, mira, esta, estas personas saben bailar el estilo de salsa que tuviste en la discoteca y ellos van a venir aquí a la universidad y nos van a dar una clase de, de, de salsa. Y la verdad no me gustó. La primera vez no me gustó porque la, los movimientos no, no se sentían natural. Entonces... Eh, Luego volví y veía personas en las discotecas bailando y yo dije, yo creo que un día, ya, yo, ya que sé que puedo aprender a través de una academia, cuando me gradué de la universidad, voy a aprender a bailar salsa. Y así fue, me gradué de la universidad y luego fui a, a Caribbean Sol, lo encontré en el internet a Ismael Otero y él fue que me enseñó mis primeros pasos de, de salsa. Y desde la primera clase me, me enamoré, eh, aprendí mis pasos básicos, luego de ahí fue un proceso de entrenar, aprender pasos, aprender técnica, aprender cómo bailar en tarima, eh, entrar al grupo semi-profesional, luego en, eh, después un tiempo entré al grupo profesional también y eh, duramos años bailando salsa y bachata hasta que ya cuando empezó, antes de que se popularizara la, la bachata, ahí fue que Ismael me dijo, mira, tú eres tremendo salsero, pero tú también bailas la bachata muy bien y la bachata un día será más grande que la salsa. Entonces yo quiero que tú estés enfrente de, de todo eso. Y él, él tuvo la visión antes de que yo la tuviera y un día... Él me dice, ¿tú conoces la, eh, la muchacha de Sire Gossel que baila con, con Grisel Ponce? Y yo, sí, ah, ella, esa va a ser la pareja tuya, porque ustedes tienen tremenda química. Y ahí fue que coincidimos, yo y de Sire. Incluso, I, it was actually before, 2015, en el 2015, nosotros empezamos a bailar como Alex y de Sire. Pero antes de eso, de Sire, como había mencionado, entrenó con nosotros en bachata y en salsa. Y entonces eso fue como quizás tres años antes, so nos no conocimos como 2012 o 2013. Ah, y ahí fue que empezó, empezó todo. The first time we did our, the first routine we had uh, was the salsa routine. And um, I think we only, we only performed that like maybe one time, two times. And, and I think we also did it, I did a, two episodes of Made. And it was on one episode of Made that on MTV that I think we performed that. <laughs> Wow, wow. Entonces es interesante porque yo sé que la música eh, latina es parte de la, de la cultura, ¿no? Pero era una cosa diferente bailar como merengue, bachata, porque son más fáciles que la salsa, ¿no? Es, es algo diferente que tienen que aprender los pasos. Y también es algo diferente bailar como en la discoteca y bailar como profesional. Entonces fue difícil convertir, convertirse en un... ¿Tiene un, un baile, bailarín profesional eh, o fue, cómo fue ese proceso? ¿Fue, fue difícil o fue algo que eh, pensaste que yo, yo no quiero hacer eso, solo voy, voy a bailar en la discoteca? <ríe> y, y tener otra cosa como trabajo, ¿no? Porque es difícil ganar dinero bailando solamente. I think it, it me, it's what kind of professional dancer. Is it in the Latin dance scene? Is it in the Afro-Latin dance scene? Or are you talking about just in general? Because that's in general, yeah. training for, 
for for like different things, but it's it's actually the first time that someone asked me this, which is or ask and observe because bueno, en español y inglés. Cuando yo comencé a, a, a bailar salsa, yo me consideraba bailarín, bailador de calle. Entonces no tenía técnica de baile, no tenía, nunca vi un ballet, no sabía lo que era un parabolé, no sabía nada de, de, de técnica de danza general, pero me gustaba la música. Yo a veces veo mis videos cuando estoy bailando bachata y bailaba en diferentes tiempos, pero siempre tuve como mucho movimiento y mucho, mucho interés y mucha energía. Entonces, eh, al principio sí, cuando Ismael eh, me propuso bailar en el equipo semiprofesional, yo le dije que no, eh, porque para mí, yo lo que, lo que quería era bailar social. Me gustaba ir a las discotecas, bailar mucho en los sociales, pero no, en, en verdad nunca me interesó eh, ser un bailarín de tarima. Incluso no sabía que habían esas oportunidades. Entonces, siendo un bailador de calle, no me llamó mucho la atención porque tampoco vi dónde me podía llevar en cuanto a mi carrera. Incluso no pensaba, yo tenía otra carrera totalmente diferente. I was in corporate America for, for a really long time, uh, for about 10 years. Um, so that was never really a, a, a vision. Pero luego me, me gustó y, you know, Ismael kept trying. Ismael me dijo, tienes que meterte al grupo porque tú eres muy bueno y tú eres la, eh, el que aprende más rápido en mi clase. Entonces... I, I took a leap of faith, I guess. <laughs> me, me, me entregué por total. Pero el proceso es continuo. I feel like I'm still trying to be a professional dancer because you never stop learning. <laughs> It's like you still, you continue to learn new things and you learn from your colleagues and your peers and you and your dance partners. And it's always, you know, I'm always still learning like new things. So I don't think I'm done in the process of learning or converting into a professional dancer. But it's also like Desiree said, it's like, I was told a professional dancer is someone who gets paid for, for the craft that they do. So in that sense, ya llevo tiempo con esto. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that, that, that everybody's definition of a professional dancer is, is very different. And, um, you know, I also think of, of what we do as, well, educators, you know, because we're, we're dance teachers. Um, but also entertainers more so uh, to a certain degree because we are cutting on a show for people when we're social dancing, when we're engaging. I mean, it's just, it's more so to me in that, like, uh, I think of us, yeah, as entertainers. And sometimes if people are professional dancers, it's like, well, what are they training for? Are they competitive dancers? So maybe that's like the stereotype that people have in their hands. But um, but when you talk about Or just this, making money, yeah. right? Making making right. a career out of it versus just dancing for fun or, you know. Yes. And that comes with a whole onset of uh, responsibilities. And, <laughs> and, and yeah. Yeah, and I have to say it's interesting because um, something you mentioned, Alex, for me, you know, I've been on a few sort of student dance teams and things like that, too. And I kind of felt like I like social dancing, right? Like, that's fun. Like, I could do whatever I want. I could like, you know, and I don't have to worry about like technique. And when I started doing some of the uh, like choreographies, even though they were like not very like difficult or anything like that. I started to feel like it felt like a job and I was like, ooh, like that's not fun anymore. Like I just wanted to dance. So for me, like I like choreography. I like to learn the technique because it makes you a better dancer. But I like to convert that into like more social dancing because that to me is the fun part. So yeah, I think it's interesting like shifting that to be to be a career. I've always kind of wondered that because I know people who love to dance, when they have to deal with the business side of it, like it gets a little bit, you know, it changes things, right? So I do want to ask you guys, because I know that you you all have done something really awesome called Dance for a Cause. And I want you to talk a little bit about that and where the idea came from. And then just has it been difficult during the pandemic to really maintain your careers as dancers and doing what you love to do when so much has been changing sort of like month by month, right? In the world and the reality and, and what you can do. Because like we can't really, in most places still, you know, at least at the time of this <laughs> recording, In most places, you still can't really safely go out and social dance. So how have you adapted sort of your vision and your company during this time? Wow, 2020 was a bender. That was a, a very, I think I'm still very surreal that we're in this. Um, 
but you know, a lot of people were in need and just seeing the need being in our houses because we live in like New Jersey and New York. So the, the lockdown was serious there. So we're like in our houses by ourselves. Like, what are we doing? People are hungry. People can't get food. This is when people were scrounging for toilet paper. Um, you know, so we're like, what can we do? We still love to dance. We have this platform. We want to, to stay connected with our dance community. We want to help people. Okay, boom, this is what we're gonna do, dance for a cause. It was really, really uh, awesome. Our first um, dance for a cause season, we partnered with Feeding America. And I think it was like 15,000 meals. Well, how many was it, Alex, that we were able to donate? Something like that, yeah. And so it was, you know, we brought people together to not only have fun, but to dance for a cause. And this last season, we partnered with Covenant House, which is an amazing organization that uh, helps homeless youth. Um, and well, they do actually way more than that. They have a whole list of services for um, youth that are struggling with different, different things. So that was really important for us because, you know, Life is a little bit more than just dance. Sometimes you need food to live. Sometimes you need a place to live to be able to, to do the things that you that you enjoy to do. So that was really important for us to do, to, to, to give back. And yeah, it was, it was a struggle because we went from legit traveling every weekend to then staying at home and not traveling at all. And sometimes you don't realize how much you love something until it's like taken away from you. So we were like, oh man, this is just really crazy. So we had time to reflect on that, but we definitely miss our, our dance community. We miss uh, seeing faces and I even miss people sweat. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm like, I miss engaging with people. You know, teaching the classes is online. It's, it's great that that's available to us, right? But it's, it's not the same as when you walk into a room and you can feel everyone's energy, collective energy. Everybody's there ready to dance, wanting to dance, listening to the song and just, it's different. But we're, we're keeping it moving with the online classes. Um, something's better than nothing. <laughs> y Alex, para ti ha sido difícil. Sí, es, fue difícil al principio porque nosotros teníamos que, que adaptarnos al nuevo concepto de, de entrenar online, de, de dar clases online, que para nosotros todavía es un poco, no complicado, sino que siempre es diferente porque tenemos siempre, por ejemplo, la diferencia de la tecnología, el internet, que es Zoom, que si la cámara, que si el ángulo, que grabé y no había odio. Entonces es, es muy... Y, y, la, y, y también para los estudiantes nuestros y nuestros seguidores acostumbrarse a entrenar con nosotros online, que es algo diferente para ellos también. Lo bueno de esa oportunidad es que nos dio una oportunidad de trabajar con personas en otros países online que quizás no tenían los recursos para poder tomar clases con Alex y Desiree. Entonces eso es, por un lado fue bueno, pero el bailar por una causa fue algo que, que, que sentí, bueno, nosotros ahora no estamos ganando dinero, muy poco dinero. No tenemos la, la libertad de ir a un estudio a dar clases. Quizás lo primero que la gente pensaría es, bueno, tienen que buscar oportunidad de hacer dinero. Pero para nosotros fue importante también, como dijo Desiree, ayudar a las personas que lo tienen peor que nosotros. Porque siempre podemos pensar, las cosas están malas, pero pueden ser peor. Entonces, eh, de ahí surge la idea de bailar por una causa. También yo siempre he querido hacer algo con organizaciones para ayudar, porque eh, creo que es muy importante... Eh, ser uno generoso con su tiempo y también con, su, con sus recursos. No todo tiene que ser económicamente, pero muchas veces podemos usar nuestro talento o nuestras plataformas para poder darle a, a los demás. Y en cuanto a, a la pandemia, es, fue difícil para muchas personas. Pero fíjate, le, le cuento una historia. Estuve en, en un supermercado, eh, bueno, antes de, de, de decir esa historia, nosotros eh, decidimos dar las clases online y también quería no tener, seguir nuestra presencia, como ya no estábamos en festivales y congresos, 
que las personas, nuestros seguidores, no puedan todavía ver un aspecto de entretenimiento de Alex y de Cire, y por eso también utilizamos nuestras redes sociales, Instagram, para crear videos eh, que la gente pueda disfrutar, no puedan ver bailar, y para decirle al mundo, hey, nosotros todavía estamos aquí, no estamos totalmente perdidos. Yo sé que ah, hubieron otros bailarines que tomaron la decisión de tomar su tiempo fuera de la red, querían su tiempo personal y eso también lo, lo respetamos. Eh, entonces, a la historia. Estoy en el supermercado cerca de mi casa y estoy buscando productos y este hombre eh, me, me topa eh, frente a los, a, a los plátanos y me dice, usted es Alex Morel de Alex y de Cire, sabes, mi esposa es fanático de ustedes, eh, por favor, yo sé que tiene prisa, pero por favor, deme dos minutos de su tiempo para que ella lo conozca. Y llama a, a su esposa y la mujer está, yo la veo y se le están aguando los ojos, que está bien emocionada. Y le digo, bueno, muchísimas encantado, soy Alex. Y ella me dice, ustedes no saben el impacto de lo que han hecho con las redes sociales en mi vida. Porque nosotros hemos estado pasando unos momentos muy, sumamente difícil y mirándote a, a, a ti, a decir, eh, bailando en las redes sociales, los videos creativos, cada semana yo miraba para ver los, los videos y la verdad que me levantó los ánimos y el espíritu. Y ella dice, la verdad, lo que, lo que ustedes están haciendo no tiene precio y, y aunque las personas no le digan, eh, la verdad que está cambiando, eh, ayudó mucho a las personas durante la pandemia, durante el COVID. Entonces, cuando yo reflejo y pienso en eso, digo, ya entiendo más porque somos quienes somos y hacemos lo que hacemos. Porque creo que cuando yo trabajaba en, en la industria, yo era informático en una empresa global. Yo no sentía que estaba dejando un impacto. Y entonces, si tú te levantas todos los días y piensas, wow, el trabajo mío, no sé si tiene significado o, o tiene valor. Cuando decidí tomar la carrera de, de Alex y de Cire, de bailarín, ahora puedo ver directamente el impacto que tenemos a las personas. Entonces, por eso nosotros nos sentimos, eh, sentimos un regocijo eh, por lo que nosotros hacemos y estamos bien orgullosos del trabajo que estamos haciendo. Wow, eso, es, eso es interesante. Bueno, primero tengo que decirte que es una historia buen dominicana que pasó enfrente de los plátanos en el supermercado. Siempre plátanos. Pero bueno, sí. Exacto, plátano power. Pero sí, es algo, creo que sí, es importante. Es, I, I think it's great that you guys, one, use your platform to help other people and not just think about looking out for yourselves. I think that's amazing. And yes, like the energy that you bring to help people, I think it is really important, especially during this time when people haven't been able to dance. I know for me, you know, I signed up for Dance for a Cause and we were talking before we started recording. I did not make it to the end and record the video, but I just loved being able to have you guys on live to be able to dance again because I miss social dancing too. Um, and just the energy that you bring and especially you, Desiree, I have to say, like you're a force of nature and I want to know like Where do you guys get your energy from? How do you keep it going when you're just... Because, like, I know a lot of people have Zoom fatigue, right? But I have to say, like, with you guys, like, there's no Zoom fatigue. Like, the energy that you bring, Desiree, was like, all right, I want to see you smiling. I want to see you dancing, like, every week. And I was like, how is she doing this? Like, what do you guys do to keep yourselves motivated when people are really experiencing a lot of different emotions with trying to manage um, life right now and everything that's going on? Coffee. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, coffee. <laughs> Mucha café. <laughs> es <un> secreto. <laughs> I will say this. It is tough sometimes to, to, well, you know, actually, I'll say this. It's, it's hard for me sometimes to pick myself up. But once I'm there, once I'm like, oh, I'm ready to dance, like I'm about to start my class or I'm in a dance class or I'm at a social or I'm at a party, like that's it. You don't even have to motivate Alex or I. And I think that's a huge part about why we've been so successful because we innately have that, you know, we're like, we love to dance and it just kind of, oozes out, you know? Um, and I think that, that that our love for dance shows up in our dance classes. It shows up when we're performing. It shows up when we're social dancing. And yeah, and I think that that goes back to 
the whole professional dancers thing, I think like to be a professional dancer, you one, and not everybody has that, but you have to just love what you do because you're gonna be doing it all the time. <laughs> so it can be like, oh, this is another bachata class. Oh, it's like, this is another opportunity for me to do what I love and to share my passion and my purpose. And, um, and I think, you know, sometimes it is like, you're like, oh, I just wanna eat ice cream and Netflix and like, you know, that kind of thing. But you're like, but then when you're in your class, you're like, wow, I'm glad that I really showed up today. I'm really glad that I was able to like share today with somebody. So, yeah. It may, it may also sound like a little bit cliche, but it's almost like doing it for the greater good or for the higher purpose because I feel the same way as Desiree. There were times where for the, even for the Dance for a Cause, I'm like, oh my God, the Zoom is starting in 15 minutes, but you know, I'm feeling really tired today, or really unmotivated. And I think it's the same thing. Once you, you, know, you turn on the camera, you see the people, the smiley faces, you, you know, you're on. And, um, and then, you know, just like Desiree, I feel like once we're there, we're 100% committed to what it is we're doing. And also, I, we always talk about this in our in our classes and in our, um, our our courses, how a lot of times what's going on outside of the studio doors has nothing to do with with those people who showed up and paid to come see you and come came to, to train with you. So it's like your experience with with um, with a dance and instructor, oh. right, whether it be positive or negative is lasting. So I'm grateful that I, you know, I always shout out my my sensei, my my uh, uh, salsa godfather, Ismael Otero, because you know he was always committed. As soon as he, you know, we 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 came into dance class, he was always ready to go, and he was there for a purpose to teach us how to dance. And I think having that positive attitude and that positive energy really makes the learning experience a lot more pleasant. Heck, look at Sesame Street and all these, you know, colorful, happy, joyous, you know, uh, training platforms, even for, for kids, right? It's like the, the when you have that good energy and that very positive vibe, it makes it easier for you to learn. And so that's kind of the way I look at it. And once I'm there, I'm there. So let's go. Yeah, you're right. Like once you kind of are on the class, like it's like when you're there to serve, I think it also... Um, does help shift your energy too because you know you're not just there for you it's not just about you showing off it's about you being there to serve people and to help them uh, learn to dance and just have a little bit of joy in the day so it definitely shows up in in everything that you guys do um, and just uh, one question last before I let you go and this is more for Alex so yo sé que ofrecen clases en inglés y también en español y tienen un sitio de web que tiene clases en los dos idiomas de salsa de, de bachata y para ti ha sido una ventaja ser bilingüe como tener una compañía de baile o, o no sé porque yo sé que hay muchas bailarinas, muchas compañías de danza no necesariamente ofrecen clases en los dos idiomas. Entonces, ¿cuál fue el proceso que decidieron hacer eso así y ha sido un, una, una ventaja para ti ser bilingüe y, y poder enseñarles a uh, los estudiantes en los dos idiomas? Bueno, primeramente es un proceso porque eh, no estamos total, totalmente bilingüe en las clases. Decidí dar sus clases en inglés yo la doy también en inglés, pero a veces hablo un poco de español. La página la diseñamos para que sea un poquito en los dos idiomas. Y nosotros tenemos un curso de certificación para los maestros, una formación que está disponible en inglés y español. ¿Por qué la importancia de eso? Porque entendemos que estamos bailando un baile latino, la música en español normalmente, los seguidores de este género, la mayoría hablan español, aunque ahora es más mundial, pero entendemos que hay fuerza en eso. Desde que yo era pequeño, eh, cuando entrevistaba para diferentes compañías, siempre preguntaban, ¿habla más de un idioma? ¿Eres bilingüe? Entonces, cuando nos preparaban para eh, las entrevistas, siempre nos decían, prepárate, educa eh, educación primera, pero también... La, cuando dos personas hacen una entrevista, siempre eh, la empresa va a buscar la diferencia. Ok, los dos son inteligentes, los dos fueron graduados, los dos tienen X calidad de, de calificación. Pero entonces hay cosas que distingue la persona, la empresa, adquirir a una persona por la otra. Ah, pero esta persona 
tiene un poco más de experiencia con, con clientes. Esta persona también habla dos idiomas. Esta persona tiene algo más que aporta fuera del, del, del currículo. Entonces, nosotros entendemos que, la, bueno, yo personalmente entiendo que es muy importante conectar con las personas en su idioma. Incluso hablo, <risa> hablo tres idiomas porque también hablo un poco de francés. Y entonces, eh, cuando, cuando estuve en Francia estudiando, eh, lo primero que me enseñaron fue uh, Je m'appelle Alex, ou est le toilet, ¿dónde está el baño? Entonces, yo me acuerdo que entendía poco, pero cuando empezaba a hablar con las personas de, de Francia y yo le decía, ah, ¿parlez-vous anglais? Y todo el mundo, no. Pero con una cara como que, no. No es posible que tú estés aquí en mi país conectando conmigo, pero espera que yo hable inglés. Entonces, para mí, yo entiendo que cuando uno conecta más con las personas en su idioma, eh, conecta más y, y, y hace que la persona se abra un poco más. Y también hay personas que no entienden nada de inglés. Entonces, <risa> tenemos que, que, que darle a, algo de español y creo que es una ventaja. Igual que los franceses. Hay franceses que no hablan inglés ni español, solamente entienden francés. Entonces, para nosotros ha sido una ventaja poder entender diferentes idiomas. Uh, ok, al final, para terminar, ¿tienen una canción favorita para bailar o en general? So, do you have a, a favorite song to dance to or just a favorite song in general? Because we always like to add stuff to our playlist uh, for the podcast. <laughs> Yo sé que es una pregunta muy difícil. <laughs> I think it's so funny that you just asked that because I was just listening to this song um, this morning and Alex and I have a routine to it. It was one of our, well, it was like our first routine coming together as Alex and Desiree and it's Tu Si Me. I love that song. I could dance to that song for, for like definitely if it comes on, I'm like, who am I dancing with? You know, for salsa, <laughs> I have a chata. Who's the uh, artist? J.U. El Rey for salsa. And for bachata is Jendi. Ah, okay. Y Alex, ¿tiene una canción favorita para bailar? <laughs> para bailar, una de mis temas de bachata favorita es de Raulín Rodríguez, Que Vuelva. Una de las muchas de Raulín, porque me gusta mucho las canciones de Raulín. Pero, y en salsa, una que me gusta mucho también es Llorando, de Orlando Collado. Una de mis temas favoritas. Pero tengo muchos. Es difícil. It depends on my mood. Sometimes I feel like romantic and big and fancy. And then other times I just want to get down. So it really depends on my mood. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Great, great, great songs. Okay. So thank you guys. Gracias por tu tiempo hoy. Thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. And do you have any projects coming up that you want folks to know about or where they can, where they can find you on uh, social media? Yes. yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> you can follow us on social media. We're on all platforms, um, Facebook, uh, backslash Alex and Desiree, Instagram, Alex and Desiree. You can follow our school page, um, Academic Network of Dance on IG. But we also have another season of our virtual choreography coming up. And we are looking for directors for our Andy Worldwide team. So if you're interested in running one of our choreographies or training with us and you have a school and you want to teach A&D technique and uh, dance a little bit of the A&D style, you can reach out to us via one of those platforms and we can make it happen. Also, we have a gift for everyone, for everyone that's tuning in. <laughs> We're going to gift everyone an opportunity to train with us at a discounted rate. So we have our online Uh, classes. Uh, we call it uh, premium. And we're going to give you guys 25% off for those who are tuning in and listening and, and part of this um, uh, this organization. Uh, the discount code is AND25 and we see 25% off on our online classes. Wow. Thank you for that. Gracias. So everybody, definitely I recommend you take advantage of that. If you have danced before or if you haven't danced before, if you haven't danced in a while, Alex and Desiree will definitely get you back dancing again or for the first time. Um, I really do think that they're great teachers. It's hard to find good teachers, right? There's a lot of great dancers that may not necessarily be great teachers, but I think with Alex and Desiree, you'll find that they are both. So that is a rare uh, combination. And you also get to practice your Spanish as well with some of the uh, with some of the classes um, if you're interested. So definitely check that out. Um, and again, we'll put the links in the show notes and so make sure you check it out. And once again, gracias, Alex and Desiree, for being on the show. Gracias. 
I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Alex and Desiree and that you definitely take them up on that offer if you want to really learn how to dance for the first time or maybe you're a little bit rusty because you haven't been dancing a lot in the past year, year and a half or if you just want to step up your game, right? And learn uh, some more skills that you can use to improve both your salsa and bachata. Definitely check out their website so that you can sign up. As always, I hope something you heard in today's episode has helped you go at least one step closer, even if it's just a small step, one step closer from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. 